Hi, I'm here with Dr. Anne-Marie Albano, Associate Professor of Psychology and Psychiatry at Columbia University and the Director of the Columbia University Clinic for Anxiety and Related Disorders. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you. So earlier today, we were talking a little bit about um, school refusal behavior, so kids who really refuse to go to school. So we were talking that, you know, it's pretty typical for kids to refuse to go to school. So how does a parent know when it's more and a, and a bigger problem? Right. Well, all children, it is, you know, as they're going through school, they're going to wake up one morning and say, I don't want to go, or have the Sunday evening. Do I have to? So there's always little complaints, and you expect that with children, um, especially following an illness, if they've been out for a few days, um, if they've changed schools to a new school, it could be at transition times, uh, you know, for different things, a test is coming up, they might, you know, not want to go to school. But that's usually a transient thing. What you, you look for is if a pattern develops. Sunday night, Every week, you can predict they're going to start complaining. I have a headache. I don't feel well. Monday mornings and each successive morning, they're delaying. They can't find things. They're taking longer to get ready. So you wind up there late getting in. And then if you start hearing complaints during the day, the school starts calling. Does your, ch your child says he's sick? We really can't tell. So if a pattern develops, and we wouldn't go more than two weeks before trying to get some intervention uh, in place in some way with the parents doing some sort of a plan for figuring out what's bothering the child and reinforcing them to manage those things and move forward to stay to get into school comfortably. So I can imagine that it's pretty hard for parents to sort of decide these things on their own. Um, are there professionals that can help parents figure out whether the school refusal behavior is serious? Well, What's difficult for the parents is, um, well, are a few things. One, if their child is acting very distressed and the parent trying to move them along to go to school causes more distress, which it will, if that parent feels guilty. Or if the parent themselves have suffered with anxiety or depression and they maybe had some school issues, they over-identify uh, with the child. You know, there's different things that gets in the way of a parent moving forward. One of the things that um, is helpful is talking to the school personnel. So the teacher, of course, is a starting point, and then maybe a school counselor or social worker to say, you know, there's something going on. They're not wanting to go in. I'm, I'm hearing these difficulties. Because maybe the teacher is noticing struggles in different ways, and they can collaborate together. And usually school psychologists who are in the school, if, if that is a system that has something like that, can help out. Otherwise, a parent would want to look for a therapist who's schooled in cognitive behavioral therapy to address the school refusal. And there are different ways to do that, um, you know, looking up through different associations and, and therapy lists of therapists um, that are available. So... Um... You mentioned cognitive behavioral therapy, so is, is that one of the uh, interventions that you would consider evidence-based for, for kids ex exhibiting school refusal behavior? That is the intervention <laughs> that has been the most backing behind it in terms of research and solid outcomes. The procedures of cognitive behavioral therapy uh, allow a therapist to get in there evaluate accurately what's going on, and figure out what's motivating this school refusal behavior. Now, there are kids who have truancy and there are conduct problems. That's a different thing. What we have found is if it, the child's behavior is of school refusal and complaining is motivated by fear, worry, panic, separation anxiety, social anxiety, um, and, you know, these kinds of anxiety and depressive symptoms, um, or else also by, you know, getting to stay home and have fun, that there are specific procedures in cognitive behavioral therapy when combined in a certain way get the most bang for the buck in getting the kids back in and teaching them skills to manage what was upsetting them to stay in school. 
So how does a parent know if the therapist that's helping them is actually using cognitive behavioral techniques? There's a couple of things parents can look for. First of all, um, to, to talk with the therapist and interview them f at first. Now, if you're watching this video, you've come to our website, uh, which is a combined website with the uh, Society for Clinical Child and Adolescent Psychology and Florida International University and the Children's Trust. You know, this is a website that's put together with these videos. There's a place on our website that you can go to, you look for it, on how to find a therapist and what are the things to ask the therapist. So the first thing is, of course, asking the therapist, do you know cognitive behavioral therapy? Have you worked with children with school refusal with cognitive behavioral therapy? Tell me what you've done. And to hear about the therapist talking about um, exposure and uh, cognitive work to change the, the way the kids talk to themselves, there's different things the therapist will say. Once you're into and starting treatment, a cognitive behavioral therapist does assessment. They're, all, they're asking you questions. They're having you keep records. They're having your child keep records. That's a big part of the treatment. They give homework. There are always things you're doing in between sessions to keep working on and practicing the skills the child is learning. And the big thing with cognitive behavioral therapy is the parent, the child, and the therapist are collaborating and working together. There's goals that are specified, and we're evaluating each step of the way from everybody's perspective if things are changing, and if not, we're readjusting to move forward. There's always you're working towards uh, certain goals. That's how you know you're in CBT, cognitive behavior therapy. Now, are there te therapy techniques that you would not recommend for school refusal behavior? Well, this is going to get me in trouble, but I'm going to say it. I would not go with traditional talk therapy, play therapy. Um, I wouldn't go with traditional therapies where, again, A, the parent is not involved in specifying goals and working in some way to help feedback to the therapist whether things are moving along. I would not go with therapies so where the parents are excluded from what's going on in the session. I wouldn't go with a therapy where the child doesn't understand from the moment they meet that therapist the, the, the goal here is to get you back to school. Um, I wouldn't go to therapies that don't teach skills for managing difficult emotions uh, such as anxiety and depression and for giving tools for relaxing and also that puts the child in the position sooner than later of working with the school and the family on getting back in, graduated ways of getting back into the classroom. I wouldn't go after those. And that, the list is wide <laughs> open as to, you know, what those therapies are. So. so some parents might ask, you know, why does my child have this problem? Why are they exhibiting school refusal behavior and does it matter for treatment? Well, this is something that cognitive behavioral therapists have gotten criticized over unfairly, that the why doesn't matter to us. How it started, when it started, what the history was. People think that doesn't matter to cognitive behavioral therapy because we sit very much in work in the here and now on what's making the problem continue, what keeps it going now, we've got to change that. But the fact of the matter is history is very important. The why this has happened is very important. And for us, we always look to see it's most likely a combination of factors. There's uh, biological and genetic factors if there's a history in the family of anxiety and depression. I, a lot of times, have found that a parent had school refusal to some degree, and now their child manifests it. And it's, they have trouble getting the child to school because they over-identify with the child. Um, you also have to find out what is going on within the child. Are they anxious in terms of social anxiety or separation? As I said, different things. And then is there something in and around going on in the family and in the school and the community that makes it difficult for the child to manage those feelings? So, you know, and how this happens is usually a combination of factors, biological, genetic, family, environment, that have all come together and shaped the way the child thinks and affects the way the child behaves to 
culminate in this school refusal. So are there any other things that you would sort of want to tell parents, something that's really important to know about school refusal behavior? Yes, the longer your child is out, the more difficult it's going to be for us to get them back in. Uh, and I mean, and that is, this is not a problem. If you see a pattern that, you know, your child is really upset, delaying, and all this stuff, and it's going on for two, three, four weeks, this, and then your child is successful at staying home, this is not a problem that self-corrects typically. And, you know, I, uh, it breaks my heart when families come in with a child who's been out a year or more. Because if I get them early, there's a great chance we can turn it around and turn it around fast. But the longer they're out, the tougher it is because they get behind academically. And they lose, lose keeping pace with their friends and peers. And a lot of things happen then that there's academic issues and, and they feel ashamed that compounds the problem. And the parents have given up. So I would say mom, dad, grandma, whoever is raising the child, as soon as you notice it, please seek help. Do not wait. And don't be ashamed to ask for help for this problem because the consequences are really long-standing and they're very serious. These kids don't grow up to be independent, well-functioning adults. Well, thank you very much for all of that information. We appreciate your advice. Thank you.